30 seconds. Thanks, Zoom. One minute and 30 seconds to put in your final suggestion for a gay penguin's natural predators. Thank you, people who pushed Batman to the top of the list. I was really egging this one on. I'm glad to see that it pushed Seals out of the lead. Very clear monochrome threat to K Penguin happiness. Personally, I was kind of vouching for Tom Cruise going up a notch as well, but happy that he's been deemed not a threat. Um, sequence snowstorms, also correct. Monochrome shortage. <laughs> These are great, by the way. We're sending over to London Zoo. BP, sharks, small-minded people, okay. Whoever's written the blog on what Captain Oates has done to merit gay penguin dread, please link it up to me afterwards, I'm intrigued. I think we have a winner with Batman. So we're gonna leave it there and start the show. Please, everybody in the Zoom room, would you make a massive, ooh, hello, ah, uh, do 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 Massive gay penguin round of applause for your host for the evening. It's me, Shan Doxy. <laughs> hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Thank you all for coming. Welcome to the Sex and Nature Salon. Tonight, we are going to answer the biggest question facing humanity. Why are we obsessed with gay penguins? It's been keeping people awake at night for centuries. And tonight, our fabulous lineup of speakers, comedians and artists will finally bring us some answers. Um, this is so cool. We've got so many people in the room. It is very exciting to have all of you here tonight, especially the very impressive display of monochrome I can see in the audience. Benedict Morrison, you're my hero. This is really, really great work. And a special points to people who put actual penguins in the room. Richard Bald and Artemy, outstanding work. <laughs> so welcome. A little bit about the Sex and Nature Salon project. This is an experimental space that we're creating with the arts and culture team at Exeter University, where we want to bring together researchers, artists, all of you, everybody curious to talk about sexuality, um, queerness in nature, the politics of it, and everything in between. You all know that we can learn loads about human beings from sex and nature. For example, if any of you have watched a dog vigorously humping a lamppost, you've seen the effect in human couples where people keep in enough sex in the relationship to ignore all the other ways they're not actually compatible. And that is the highbrow comedy tone I wanted to launch the evening with. My name's Shan, I'll be your host and compare for the evening. You are our first audience, so I really hope that you have a wonderful time and thank you for building this cool experimental thing with us. You have an amazing lineup of speakers and comedians ahead of you, as well as some exciting games and penguin challenges. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Zoom is full of unexpected surprises, so we've chosen to mostly mute people for the duration of the event. However, penguin communication is uniquely suited to the visual landscape, so please show our acts loads of love and support by penguin clapping and flapping when we bring them on stage. And please feel free to use the Zoom chat function to communicate with us as you would normally. Also, very excitingly, we have built a guest book, which we would love you to use. I will just show you that on my screen. Uh, can Shan use Zoom? Sorry. Okay, let's just minimize you. Thank you for bearing with. Okay, so we're gonna put this link to our mural. This is our guest book, which we would love you to make yours. Um, we're gonna put the link to this mural app up in the chat. 
this event is for you as well. So as the event goes on or after, please sign our guest book um, with any thoughts you have that come up over the night, links to things that it's made you think of or which you're working on, doodles, notes, whatever you like, really. This space is yours. Um, you're an amazing community and we would love to keep the conversation going about gay penguins and everything related after the event as well. So that's our little guest book. Also, who knows, maybe you will be inspired to start out your own performances. All of the comedians on the bill, myself included, started doing what we do by coming up with show ideas from our very own bedrooms. And look where you could be. Please take it forward. So let's get cracking. I am so excited about the lineup we have for you tonight. Uh, we have academic researchers who are experts on sexuality in nature. We have stand-up comedians. We have contacted London Zoo to ask about the UK's A-list gay penguin couple, Ronnie and Reggie, who were not available for this show. We expect they have difficult childcare issues. However, we do have two star gay penguin guests to help guide us through the show and answer all of your burning gay penguin questions. So please give a massive warm round of flapping penguin applause to Penguin Rachel and Penguin Ruby. Hey. Hello. Hey, Rachel and Ruby. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Penguin Ruby, where are you? Can we see you? Hey, how's it going? How's your day been, Penguin Ruby? Good, thanks. Yeah, um, you know, lockdown comes pretty naturally to me. Used to the isolation here in Antarctica or the Arctic. I'm it not a scientist. Very it is a very barren landscape behind you. Um, <laughs> looks Yeah, very... the tundra. <laughs> Thanks so much for, that's amazing that you've got Wi-Fi out there. That's really cool of you to Skype in, it's appreciated. Um, uh, Penguin Ruby, you have been friends with Penguin uh, Rachel for a long time. How did you two meet and how did you become friends? Uh, so we met when we were very small penguins at Penguin School. Um, my parents asked Rachel to walk me to Penguin School and the rest is history. And you know, when you're, when you're a pair of gay penguins, people always think you're a gay penguin couple. Uh, we get that all the time, but we are actually just gay penguin friends. That's so wonderful. Thank you for bringing your um, message. Also, like, really great that penguins can now hold hands or flippers in public. I mean, firstly, just logistically, anatomically, that's quite impressive, as well as sociologically. Um, penguin it took Rachel. a lot of work. <laughs> penguin Rachel, amazing to have you at the show as well. How are you doing? How's your day been? Um, I'm immediately thinking that I did less well with my background than Penguin Ruby. Um, that's my first uh, reaction. I look more like a sort of single penguin bachelor than a uh, penguin in the tundra. Um, but otherwise good. Otherwise, otherwise very happy, very pleased. I be. appreciate the divorced penguin dad aesthetic. Um, it is a kind of a barren landscape, emotionally, maybe more than physically. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going for. Divorce penguin dad. Yeah. What is the what does the gay penguin do when the other gay penguin leaves him? It's this. Welcome. <laughs> um, penguin Rachel, it's been a difficult couple of months for everybody. Um, have you found any new like hobbies or interests to keep yourself busy over this period? Uh, doing some penguin ice whittling, just making little ice sculptures and a bit of a bit of dancing. Like old oh. old pal happy feet. So let's go for that. <laughs> um, is there like a division in the penguin community between people who made it into happy feet and the rest of the rest of the group yeah I would say so I think it's a bit it's, it's quite a lot of that celeb culture going on which uh, I'm not a massive fan of but sometimes you just gotta you just gotta do what you do with it <laughs> It's difficult times for everyone. Well, thank you so, so much for joining us tonight. It is so exciting to have you both here to give us your expert insight and wisdom on the gay penguin, gay penguin lives. So we are going to start the show with a bit of a game to get everyone to know each other a bit better. An icebreaker, if you will. Our first game for the night is called Bouncers. So at the Sex and Nature Salon, one of our aims is to build the world's finest gay penguin nightclub. And what's the key attribute of a nightclub? Bouncers being there to keep out the riffraff. You will obviously see that there's a pandemic and I haven't been to a nightclub in a very, very long time. But as you all know, people often try and sneak things into nightclubs that do not belong there. And we at the Sex and Nature Salon have identified the key things that people try to bring in. These are...
leggings, David Attenborough, and olives. These we have identified as the main offenders that people will try and bring into the nightclub. So one of these has to be barred from the club, but which one? The way the game works is, we are going to break you up into teams where you become the bouncers and you decide. The way it works is in your breakout rooms. Firstly, you'll have five minutes. Select in your team the person who is most threatening, the scary one, the person who looks like they remember what it was like in Nam. They are your bouncer. And then between you, decide which of the three things is going to be barred from the nightclub. Is it leggings? We get it, you know, trousers are restrictive, but should they really be allowed in? Is it David Attenborough? We also get it, he's have a hard time, he's really worried about climate crisis, he needs a night off, but maybe he shouldn't be allowed in. Or is it olives? You wanna have a snack and look sophisticated, but is this what we want on our premises? Cool, so to recap, you will be in your breakout rooms. Select the person who you think is most scary and then decide between you which item of the three is barred. Are we all good to go? Give me a bit of a wave if we're all good. I think we should put that. Sweet. Okay, let's put everyone in breakout rooms and here we go. <laughs> awesome. Welcome back, everybody. I am very, very curious about what your conversations were. Cool. So let's see the bouncers. Please give me a wave if you were selected as the bouncers. Had Adam and Vicky, Ina over there. Benedict and Naomi, cool. So we're going to allow our gay penguin guest to select who was the key bouncer and who they feel can pe keep the room most safe. So why don't we start with Naomi? Uh, let's see, Naomi Glanville. Um, can you unmute yourself, Naomi? Hello. Hello. You were selected as the... <laughs> hey, Naomi, uh, what did you decide was unsafe for the Gay Penguin nightclub? Um, well, we all absolutely love leggings, so it just couldn't be leggings. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> and we found many reasons why an olive just couldn't be in our nightclub. <laughs> um, we we, we realised we're all very well-trained risk assessors, and for that reason, olives could not be in a nightclub um so the residue you could slip on the floor the sort of this horrid slimy residue or even the pips as well uh, which you can also choke on especially if you're drunk and then also um we felt a bit of black could get stuck on your tooth and it just really wouldn't look very attractive <laughs> okay so an in-depth risk assessment from this oh team but yeah. yeah, we're banned and falls, everything <laughs> Okay, really thorough. Thank you so much, Naomi. Um, Adam and Vicky, who were in my room, uh, could you guys Hello. unmute yourselves? Hey. Hey, hey, hey guys. So, <laughs> banned so, team number two. What was banned from your room? So we also selected olives. We were a bit less scientific and a bit less health and safety conscious than the other group. Um, but we just felt olives were wrong. It was more a kind of emotional rather than a rational feeling. <laughs> Okay, great. So blocking the emotional impact of olives on the rest of the nightclub. Very solid defense. Ina, you were the selected bouncer for your group. Unmute yourself and come in. Hello. Hello. Um, so we decided, uh, people decided that David Attenborough is a eugenicist because he talks a lot about population control and that therefore he cannot be um, admitted to this uh, nightclub. It is dark chat for a nightclub, I guess. Okay, cool. So this bouncer yeah, team. It was a tough call between that or Olives. <laughs> cool. Team three, ban on David Attenborough. And who was the uh, who was the other person selected as a bouncer? Benedict Morrison, uh, man of the outstanding suit and background. Unmute yourself, Benedict. Thanks. Hi. Now, <clears throat> our, our first thought was olives for precisely the health and safety uh, reasons that have already been suggested. But then I thought, do you know, this is privileging human beings over penguins. Penguins are extraordinarily well equipped to deal with slippery surfaces. Not just that, but they seem, if documentaries are to be believed, to love skating across the ice. So we think not only are we going to encourage olives, we are also going to smear oil everywhere 
to allow human beings to make fools of themselves falling on their asses, while penguins are allowed to be their natural selves and celebrate that. Now, Attenborough was then discussed, population control was discussed, also the fact that he may make the penguins feel a little self-conscious, but we don't want to ban him because you know, it would be a controversial move. So we're allowing Attenborough, but only in certain spaces. I know this wasn't in the rules, but we've changed the rules. The penguins have to have some Attenborough free zones. So finally, we decided leggings, because the thing about leggings, much as we may love them, what could be more comfortable for a night clubbing than leggings? But penguins are slightly, arguably, disadvantaged when it comes to the whole leg thing. And wearing leggings, therefore demonstrating, revealing our long human legs, may make the penguins feel somewhat embarrassed about the fact that they don't really have them. So, leggings it is. Go. Leggings it is. Benedict, also, please add the details to your 2022 Edinburgh Fringe show on what was banned <laughs> from the Gay Penguin nightclub. We are all there in spades. Um, also, just a slight comment. If you're, spe if you're smearing oil all over the club, you've got yourself a different kind of event, which we will not kink shame by excluding from the realm of possibility. Rachel and Ruby, a series of very compelling arguments for what has been banned from the nightclub there. You can select two bouncers, um, fine to have a team, but which... Um, which of you gave the most convincing argument for what should be banned? Ruby, let's ask you first. Um, so I'll, I'll work through chronologically, um, Naomi, like fantastic reasoning. I do have to ask though, do we have teeth to get Olive stuck in? I'm, I'm actually not sure if we do or not. So that, that held me up a little bit. Um, so Adam and Vicky, very, very strong. And so far, I've got to say I'm leaning your way because there's two of you. So I think that you could actually take uh, our true enemy, which is, of course, straight polar bears. You got it in the first ones. Um, they take up a lot of space in our clubs, literally. Um, so Ina, David Attenborough. Yes, if you can keep a like A-list celebrity like that out, I think you can keep anything dangerous out, which I love. Um, Morrison, love the grease. Went to the grease. This happens sometimes to penguins. There's nothing we can do about it. It's a it's a terrible genetic flaw that we all have. Um, you know, when you lose your beak, it's hard to think. But also, thank you for banning leggings, because as you know, we don't have legs, just feet. Um, but ultimately, I think I'm going to come back to Adam and Vicky. I think you're my winners. I like the team. I like the partnership. I think you're going to keep us very safe in our club. Amazing. Round of penguin applause for Adam and Vicky. Nice. Okay, cool. So we have one, I mean, kind of two for the price of one already, set of bouncers to defend the club. Penguin Rachel, what were your thoughts about your personal safety levels? Um, in front of you? So similarly thought, Naomi made very good points about the olives. Um, if I'm being completely honest, I thought she was too kind. She had very kind eyes. I think I'd be welcomed into that club. Um, I don't think I don't think that would scare. I think you'd just get everyone in, um, just not eating olives. But I don't know if well maybe they would. I don't know. It's very kind, very kind bouncer, which I wasn't sure would be that effective. Um, Adam and Vicky, I was very won over by Adam's hair. I I couldn't possibly say why. Um, why I like the hair, but a uh, big fan of the hair. I thought that would make an excellent uh, bouncer hair. Um, and the emotional impact of olives is very important um, to uh, penguins. Ina was very good. I have to confess, I was in Ina's breakout room, so I am quite uh, biased. Um, so Ina was my winner uh, because she was my team. Um, and Benedict, thinking of the penguins, I really like that. If anything, you're a better penguin than we are. Um, very impressed by your work and your knowledge. Um, so yeah, so my winner is Ina. Because... Cool, round of penguin victory applause for Ina. Well, that set us up for the night. I'm glad that the Penguin nightclub is safe. Thank you so much, Rachel and Ruby. So, uh, speaking of one of our elected bouncers, it gives me great pleasure to bring on our first speaker of the night, who will be speaking for about 10 minutes and then answering your questions. You will have met her just now. Some of you already know her. She's the genius mega brain behind this whole, the whole operation um, and an expert on the politics of sexual nature. From the Modern Languages Department of Exeter University, University, please give a massive warm penguin welcome to Dr. Ina Linga. 
Hi everyone, I'm just going to share my screen, show you pictures of cute penguins. There we go. Hope you can see that. Did someone nod? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, hi everyone. Um, so when we advertised this event, we received a lot of messages, mostly containing penguin gifts, for which many thanks. Um, but also we received some reading suggestions, um, which is great, and please keep them coming. Angela Aguajo, who's an associate professor of cinema and digital culture at Southern Illinois University, got in touch to tell us about a chapter that she wrote about the documentary film March of the Penguins, uh, which came out in 2005. And on a formal level, Aguajo argues, the film asks the audience to see connections um, between penguin and human life. So those aspects of penguin life that we see in the, in the film uh, represent themes of uh, monogamy, sacrifice and child rearing. Um, so the film serves as a narrative to naturalize kind of Christian and conservative values amongst penguins um, and then encourages us to do as the penguins do. Um, However, and this is where the seals become a really interesting choice, some penguin experts have pointed out that penguins actually do change partners and they do a lot of other sort of questionable stuff. So we can see that much of the penguins is highly selective and presents uh, deeply political issues as quote unquote, only natural. Four years after March of the Penguins was released, an episode of um, Parks and Rec poked fun um, at the kind of reductive reading uh, of human animal behavior. In the episode, protagonist um, Leslie Nope presides over a marriage ceremony of two penguins during a publicity stunt for the local zoo. And it soon transpires that the penguins are actually both male. And Leslie Nope wants to remain apolitical, but because we must do as the penguins do, she has essentially just sanctioned gay marriage. Hilarity ensues as her obsession with gay penguins drives her to extreme action. And then in 2019, London Zoo encouraged us to be political and to stand up for gay rights via two gay penguins. In partnership with Stonewall, they put up signs in the penguin enclosure that stayed some penguins are gay, get over it. So now we learn that if penguins can be gay, so can you, or can you? In response to London Zoo's penguin pride, Caroline Farrow of recent Exeter Debating Society fame tweeted, spare me the virtue signaling about gay penguins. Animals do not exhibit human sexuality, end of. But that really isn't the end of gay penguin obsession in what I'm sure is a completely unintentional move. Farrow asks deeply profound questions. Do animals have sexuality? And if we assume that virtue signaling is a misspelling of LGBT plus rights here, then what work does penguin sexuality do for human sexual politics? Why are we so obsessed with gay penguins? So in my research, um, which I am afraid is not on penguins yet, um, I explore how non-human animals uh, um, model, complicate, um, and contradict the ways in which us humans understand sex, gender, and sexuality. And we don't just do this with penguins, but we do this with all sorts of animals. In 2018, British newspapers reported that same-sex mice were having babies, but warned at the same time that this would not be possible for human same-sex partners anytime soon. Jordan Peterson thinks we should all channel our inner lobster, um, by which I think he means machismo or maybe masculinity, I'm not sure. Um, I think Sean is the expert in this, so we can ask her. Um, and the German uh, comic writer, Illy Anna Heger, uses hermaphroditic snails in their comics to explain how new gender neutral pronouns might change the German language. So non-human animals are used to open up radical um, radical opportunities for reproduction and pronoun use, um, but also serve as a model for conservative values. And in my research project, I trace this concern for animal sex, gender and sexuality back to the late 90s and the early 20th century in Germany and Britain, um, a time and place when modern concepts of sex, gender and sexuality emerged, including sexology, psychoanalysis, genetics and endocrinology. And at the same time, artists, writers and performers engaged with changing gender roles and gay and trans rights movements also emerged. 
And we can say that this was a period of sexual knowledge production in which artists, writers and scientists co-produced knowledge about sex, gender and sexuality. And what I argue in my work is that they did so by also looking at animal sex and that this concern for non-human sexuality and gender was actually foundational to the ways in which our modern concepts of sex, gender and sexuality emerged in the first place. So in the 45 minutes that I have left, I want to take you back to the interwar uh, years in Germany and introduce you to two examples of animals that were of interest to scientists and writers thinking about sex. And those two animals are moths and ants. So some of you might have heard of the German Jewish sexologist Magnus Hirschfeld. Um, Hirschfeld was a sexologist based in Berlin who worked as a sexual rights activist, writer, publisher and practitioner. And he also co-founded the Institute of Sexology in Berlin. Now, what might be a slightly less well-known fact is that Hirschfeld's Institute also contained a butterfly and moth breeding station um, in order to, quote, conduct bastardization experiments and achieve intersex variations through crossbreeding, end of quote. So why moths and butterflies? His most well-known scientific contribution to the study of sexology was his theory of sexual intermediacy, which argued that any form of sexual intermediacy was part of the natural constitution of body and mind rather than an acquired behavior. So finding sexual diversity in the animal kingdom helped him to naturalize human sexual diversity. But there are other reasons for why he chose butterflies and moths in particular. The German Jewish geneticist Richard Benedict Goldschmidt, who was also based in Berlin, had been conducting experiments on moths and butterflies since the 1910s. And in fact, it was in the context of his work on butterflies that he coined the term intersex. Now, intersex is used today with a different but a related meaning as an umbrella term that includes several, uh, several variations in sex characteristics that do not fit standardized definitions for male or female bodies. And for Goldschmidt in the 1910s, intersex actually included an even broader variation that included, um, at least as he conceptualized it in the 1910s, homosexuality and explicitly human homosexuality, even though his experimental work focused not on humans, but on butterflies or moths. And these experiments with um, butterfly genetics were then immediately put to political users. So the historian Hegel Satzinger has shown that the eugenicist Fritz Lenz used Goldschmidt's work to argue that interracial sexual contact was the cause of degeneration because it um, supposedly led to an erosion of a clear sex, uh, sex binary. Hirschfeld, meanwhile, used Goldschmidt's experiments to argue for the naturalness of homosexuality and other forms of sexual intermediacy. And what I find particularly interesting about Hirschfeld's take on intersex butterflies is that he criticizes um, Goldschmidt's method. So Goldschmidt relies on experiments in a lab environment, but Hirschfeld was much more interested in observing individuals, um, both human and non-human, in their natural habitat in the wild. And one image in Hirschfeld's publication shows um, intersex butterflies found uh, near Lake Tegel in Berlin, uh, where Hirschfeld also lived, which is the image of these two butterflies here. Now, comparing lab-bred butterflies to the LGBT plus population of Berlin could have been interpreted to imply a sense of breeding and purpose in homosexuality. Strategically, Hirschfeld might have found it more suitable to find butterflies in the wild to support his view that homosexuality is naturally occurring rather than a cultural or a cultivated phenomenon. To me, this shows that Hirschfeld may have been interested in the genetics of intersex and the biology of diversity, but that his interest um, in local intersex butterflies just living their lives in the middle of Berlin on a sunny day um, was also to some extent uh, symbolic. So, and I want to move on to my second and last example, um, ants. Uh, in 1925, the German writer Hans Heinz Evers published a book called Ameisen or Ants, um, which is a natural history book interrupted by various interludes in which Evers ventriloquizes ants to comment on human sexual morality. And you won't find these um, sexy bits in the English translation because they've all been um, edited out. Evers was a horror writer interested in scientific advances of the day. Um, he knew Hirschfeld and supported his activism and they also published together. And Evers also knew Goldschmidt, whom he met when both were prisoners of war in the US during World War I. Um, in 1931, Evers conveniently forgot his Jewish colleagues and joined the Nazi party at the same time as his books were actually also censored and banned by the Nazis. 
So I hope that Eva's um, sexy and stories will give you nightmares, but um, I can only hope. So here's one. Evas begins by telling his readers about the reproductive organs of the blood red queen, in particular the spermatheca, a receptacle in which sperm is stored after mating. And this is followed by an imagined inner monologue of an ant who comments on the ridiculousness of human reproduction. Poor girl, the ant thinks, you need a man? Well, what if there isn't one? Then I can't have children, the human lady admits. The ant has to laugh. She can't imagine anything as ridiculous as someone needing a man to make babies. The blood red uh, queen or redwood ant can store sperm for her entire life. Fertilized eggs result in female worker ants, but she can also lay unfertilized eggs, which result in males. And this form of virginal reproduction or parthenogenesis, Eva writes, is under-researched in ants and, drum roll, in humans, he claims, and tells the following gothic tale. In 1921, Lady Bates gives birth to a child born of parthenogenesis, whose true father is, in fact, Sir Norman Bates, her biological father, who lives thousands, biological brother, sorry, um, who lives thousands of miles away. Um, after a lot of drama, which I will spare you, um, it is revealed that the that demons are actually responsible for this virginal and yet incestuous uh, conception. The humans involved in this story are shocked and they are appalled, but the inner monologue of the sniggering and offers a commentary on this scene. Humans are just a bit weird about sex, because can anyone imagine an ant making such a fuss about parthenogenesis? In Eva's description of ant life and human life, human prudishness about sexuality suddenly looks pretty ridiculous. So why are we obsessed with animal sex, whether it's about asexuality or intersex or macho lobsters or gay penguins? As I'm only just starting out on this, on this project, I can't give you any answers as to the why, but I hope that my examples show that we definitely are obsessed and that animals are put to various and varied um, uses when humans want to talk about sex. Thank you so much. And I think I now take your questions. Here's a seal. Amazing! Massive round of penguin applause for Ina Linga! <laughs> Incredible! Um, there's so much in there that we could unpack for like so many different sessions. We've got a couple of minutes for questions um, and yeah there's just loads um, that I'm sure people want to poke about so if you have a question uh, if you want to give me a little wave and then unmute yourself and come in. Um, let's see, any takers? Rebecca, hey, unmute yourself and come in. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, um, thanks so much. That's really fascinating. And also, I've really enjoyed the whole thing so far. Um, I had a question, it's it's sort of a boring question in a way, but I, I'm quite intrigued by this guy, Avers, that you've just introduced us to. Bit of a shame, obviously, that he turned out to be a Nazi in the end. Um, shame, and I just yeah. wondered how widely his very intriguing ant book was read. I mean, is it, is there a kind of story of its reception? How, what do people think about it? I don't, you know, he's really popular. His, his other books, which are mostly sort of sexy horror stories are really popular because they are sexy horror stories. And he really likes writing about contemporary, sort of contemporary of his time, new scientific development, as long as it's also related to sex. Um, and so he is quite famous and well known, but then towards the that kind of period of his career, he started writing stuff that people thought was le were less interesting. Um, and it kind of sort of cut his demise culminates in, the, in, in him writing a biography of a, of a Nazi martyr. And then people just stop reading him because they think he's boring. Um, so, and, and also the translation, the ant people, which kind of gives everything away, which is a really stupid translation. Um, it just takes edits out all the sexy bits. So it's just a natural history book about ants written by a horror writer. It's really confusing. Um, so I would say it probably wasn't massively um, popular. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, just, to, I mean, the story of that translation then is also a really interesting one. Like who made the decision to cut all the sexy bits out? That's quite, that'd be good to know about as well. 
Yeah, oh. I, don't, I, I actually don't know much about the translation. So, I'll, I'll, yeah, because I'll definitely look um, into that. But it is surprising. I feel like Evers is the kind of guy who, if he was writing today, he would sort of write for Vice or something. Like, you know, he'd be like that kind of person who is really weird, no one really likes, but they kind of like the stuff he writes, but he's not a good person. Um, so it'd be interesting to see who would translate that kind of work. I want the early 20th century German sexologists sitcom to come out. They all sound super intense. Cool. Any other questions for Ina? You've got, I'm going to give you four or five seconds to jump in. If not, no worries. Cool. Hey, another massive round of applause for Ina. That was amazing. Now, we have another challenge for you. Obviously, no self-respecting queer salon would be a self-respecting queer salon without, you guessed it, a drag show. Did we create a whole event so I could use those four seconds of audio? Yes, very, very possibly. We are going to play the Emperor Penguins Drag Race. So the competition works like this. You are going to put into teams again, like we did the first time. And in those teams, you will be challenged to come up with your penguin drag king, drag queen, or drag them. It is International Pronouns Day. The pronouns for penguin queer royalty haven't been set in stone yet, but we're doing our best and we're excited to see what you come up with too. So in your teams, the challenge is, uh, firstly, select a team captain who will present your drag penguin to the room, uh, come up with a name for the drag penguin, and then select a song that they would perform their routine to. Then it gets interesting. Half of the room will have access to our mural where we're gonna very quickly sketch and mock up the drag penguin. And the other half will be challenged to find an object in your home that the penguin would use to make its fabulous drag routine outstanding. So to recap, in the rooms, select a team captain, choose a drag name for the penguin, choose a song, and then half of you will be drawing for the other guys, it is scavenger hunt we are not expecting you to have a full drag penguin routine by the end of it it's kind of like a concept sort of brainstorming session and then our queer penguins will select the winner we ready some vague kind of like <laughs> some kind of like shakes and apprehension that is exactly what we want sweet let's get you into breakout rooms and make a penguin um hey florence so what did your team devise pitch us the drag well, uh, we would like to present to you the one and the only, the cock hopper. Cock hopper. Oh my God, I can't even say it right. The cock hopper, like the rock hopper. Um, uh, she has um, uh, a long ponytail like Ariana Grande because of course her opening song is side to side because not only does she hop the cocks, but she also hops side to side. Um, and uh, I think Ina has done a drawing of Cock Hopper. Yes. Um, and as an object, we have, um, because we were also the group that wanted to smear oil all over the floors of our nightclub, we thought we would also give her as her prop oil um, because it helps with the hopping of both the cocks and, and the ice. <laughs> I mean, if that wasn't already a five star performance with the mythos, I'm just going to share my screen and demonstrate um, what this person looks like. Um, outstanding work from this team. Very impressive. The competition already very strong. Thank you so much, Florence. Sweet. Uh, who were the other team captains? Looks like Adam and Vicky. Oh, were Adam and Vicky selected as team captains again? And Anna. Uh, we were not selected as team captains, <laughs> but we have just been volunteered as team captains, I think. Great. Unmute yourself and come in. You have been bullied into being team um, captains. Yes. It's a cool. environment. Oh, again. Awesome. So, <laughs> um, so we want to introduce Miss Regurgitator. Based on one of the most famous features of penguins. <laughs> I think you guys can guess. Um, and, you know, Mr. Regurgitator, can't say it, just loves the bird seed. So we have 20 kilograms of bird seed, which is enough to make any penguin regurgitate. Just happen to have it 
in case this evening went well. She, she has the ability to eat all of it in one go and make yep. it last for like two years. Yep. Amazing skill. And our song is Man Eater, because if you eat a man after all the bird seeds, you will again regurgitate. <laughs> Um, amazing commitment for you to prepare birdseed in the lead up to this event. You've already won the outstanding prize of like <laughs> most qualified people to be part of the Gay Penguin Sex and Nature Salon. That was outstanding. So Miss Regurgitator, Dancing to Man Eater with this very complex birdseed routine. Incredible, strong competition. Anna, Anna Bud, you were selected as team captain. How did it um, go? I've got to be honest, <laughs> I went to the loo for a little bit of that and <laughs> I may have missed the end of our conversation, but I have got a hat, um, <laughs> which is my prop. So could I, my other team members, is it okay if like you chip in a little bit? Oh, you've got heels. Oh, oh that's amazing. amazing. Yes. So we have okay. hat and heels. Um, our, we, we came up with the name black, white, and red all over. Oh, so, uh, that wasn't, that was our team that came up. Uh, and uh, kind of kinky, I guess, was what we, what we came up with. Um, and a song, we, I mean, we're open, it's a karaoke um, penguin, so like drag act, so we're really open to suggestions basically. You That's also, cool. I mean, you had two props, so you got like, you know, a double on one of the criteria. I think that's already like uh, outstanding. Um, amazing. So black, white, red all over with the hat and the heels, karaoke penguin, very versatile, could work, you know, the sort of like busy stag do's as well as the more queer intensive political drag art, uh, drag nights. Amazing. Okay, we have one more team, which is my team. So Joseph and Patrick, where are you? If you'd like to unmute yourselves and come in. Hey. Hello. So, so <laughs> we slightly broke the rules and came up with a penguin drag family. Um, so accident. <laughs> we don't need to tell them that. Yeah? We don't need to tell them it was an accident. <laughs> um, so we've got um, Antarctica, Antarctica, and uh, the matriarch Antarctica, um, who, uh, and, and we're introducing you slowly to their um, family friendly drag penguin story time names um, when they perform their act later on in the Penguin Club. Um, their names develop. Um, into uh, Antar Slicker, uh, Pants Are Slicker, um, and Arm Are Slicker. Yeah. Um, their um, entry number is um, the song Antarctica by Men Without Hats. Um, and I don't know, maybe the finale is the safety dance or something because the penguins would look good doing that. Yes, definitely. They're very safety conscious. They are. Um, as we've been hearing from lots of the other um, teams already this evening, yeah. safety is, is paramount. Got a lot of risk assessment in the audience, um, which makes me feel very safe. I'm obviously biased because you were my team. I'll just give the others a quick synopsis of two, a mere two of the many names that this penguin can occupy, our penguin that transcends not only gender, but age restriction guidelines, uh, versatile for any club. Wow, okay, uh, Penguin Rachel and Penguin Ruby, it's gonna be a tough one. To recap, we had Miss Regurgitator, really like complex and I'd say quite baffling, but somehow beautiful bird seed ingesting and regurgitating act. We had the also very versatile black, white and red all over cabaret penguin act. Very, very, very cool. Um, we had the one we just saw, my team and our slicker, the penguin of many names, uh, the penguin where names simply do not apply. And I did idiot and I didn't write down the first name, but I will know it, yeah, when I saw Florence and the incredibly in-depth Cockhopper Penguin, dancing to Side to Side by Ariana Grande and whose kind of mythos, Cockhopper, sorry Florence, <laughs> Cockhopper, Shan can't read, um, who frankly, like the amount of backstory that came with the Cockhopper is like a kind of biog in and of itself. 
I don't know how you're going to select the winner between these, but Penguin Ruby, got to make a call. Who was the outstanding drag contest entry for you? Okay, well, once again, I'll, I'll run through what I loved about all of you. Um, so Adam and Vicky, 20 kilograms of bird seed, stunning. I hope you don't have pet birds. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> so Anna, uh, I mean, hat, heels, and nothing else is the best drag outfit I can really imagine. So you're going to slay. Um, Joseph and Patrick, you should be so proud. You've started the noble house of Tartica. You've started a legacy. Your names are going to live forever. However, I think for me, the winner might have to be Cockhopper because Rachel will back me up on this. Side to side is the Penguin Anthem, and we sing it all the time. And I don't, I don't know how you knew. I don't know how you knew, but it's going to be Cockhopper for me. Uh, well, psychic points to Florence and all of Florence's team. Well done. Massive congratulations. We have Ruby's winner. Rachel was... Oh, Rachel uh, has reappeared. Penguin Rachel, um, who was your outstanding drag entry? Similar to what Ruby's saying, that was outstanding, like, incredible work. Like, if these don't become actual acts, it will be the saddest thing that has happened to the Penguin community in decades like jesus they're all so good similar to what ruby said side to side a banger for humans just an absolute banger for penguins like such a strong song and such a great name cock copper so big fan of that one um loved anna with the black white and red all over the pun theme again coming in with joseph and patrick the full family show that's fantastic the adams family of the penguin world and I hope they were sort of like weirdly horrific and it sounds like with a lot of arse liquor they probably are um so big fan of that but for me I think the winner was uh Miss Regurgitator just because that bird seed like you know if there's one thing if there's one thing penguins are impressed by it's <laughs> ingesting 20 kilograms of bird seed in one go and then I assume just spraying it everywhere in one horrifying display of dominance and also prowess um so for me the winner was miss miss regurgitator amazing well like just outstanding work from all of the teams but a huge round of applause for the joint winners cock hopper and miss regurgitator <laughs> well done everyone outstanding work so on that we're gonna have our next speaker um, i'm super excited that she's here at the show with us she is honestly one of the most impressive people who i have ever met she is a science stand-up comedian as well as the director and the founder of the vagina museum in london and if anyone's got a better better linkedin bio than that than that I just don't believe you. Sorry. So it's super cool to have her here. Please bring her on with a warm, massive Penguin virtual round of applause. It's Florence Schechter. Thank you so much. Oh my God, I'm so excited to be here. Um, Sean did uh, email me and was like, do you, would you like to do a set? for this thing called why are we so obsessed with gay penguins you can do it about anything you want and I was like I literally could do it about gay penguins so that's what I'm gonna do um this is an excerpt uh, from my comedy show queer by nature um which I was totally gonna tour this year um oh well um but I'm so I'm really really excited to be able to at least do some of it once this year thank you to all of you um so uh yeah this is all about kind of um what it's called same sex sexual behavior um so i'll start off with a little caveat which is that, like you can't really use the word gay actually with animals um because uh you know these are like very human terms you know a, uh, an animal can't tell you i identify as gay i identify as pan or ace or whatever like you can only really assume things from watching their behavior um of which uh you know if you if you are watching animals have sex then as much as I do. Um, uh, so I just wanted to start with that little caveat. Um, the reason that I was so interested in this is because, um, you know, I am bi. I have come out a hundred times uh, on stage. First time online, this is fun, thank you. Um, never to my parents. 
um, but only because I don't come to my gigs. I, I genuinely don't know how else to come out to them. That's a genuine question. If you could DM me, that would be great. Thanks. Um, uh, the other caveat, um, oh, and uh, sorry. So th that's why I wanted to look into it because I'm bi, but I have a science degree. Um, and when I was growing up, I had a very like conservative kind of religious upbringing and I was told you know it's unnatural to be gay like it's oh it's you know it's not it's unnatural that's what I was always told and I was like oh wait hold on a minute like I have a science degree like I could literally find out if it's unnatural or not and so I started doing some research um and I, I thought I would just show you what I've learned about gay penguins um the other caveat I want to say though is that just because something's like natural doesn't make it good and just because something's unnatural does it make it bad? Like, for example, um, the black widow spider very famously eats her mate after sex. That's obviously not a good thing to do for humans. Um, unless he voted Tory, then like fucking go for it. Um, <laughs> it is so weird doing comedy on Zoom. I hope you enjoyed it. I have no idea. Um, uh, so anyway, so I'm sure uh, some of you are thinking like, oh yeah, if you wanted to research uh, same-sex sexual behavior in animals, where would you start? Probably with evolution, which would take you to Darwin. Um, any fans of Darwin here? You're wrong. I see you, Sean. You're wrong. Darwin was a douche nozzle and I'm gonna show you why. Um, before I show you how he fucked up being gay, I'm gonna show you how he fucked up being straight. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen. Because basically, um, when he was around, like, in his late 20s, he decided that he um, thought it might be a good idea to be married. So he did what every scientist does, and he made a pros and cons list. And this is his real pros and cons list. Um, you can see up there, oh, uh, oh no, sorry. Um, this is what happened before. Um, when I clicked on it, let me try again, sorry. There we go. Okay, there, I sorted it. So we met, so Darwin makes his pros and cons list in 1838. Marry, not marry. And under things like not marry, he puts arguments such as would have no money for books. Yeah, he's re really got his priorities straight there. But under things like uh, reasons to marry, he genuinely writes things like um, object to be beloved and played with. Yes, object object. So you can already see Darwin is not a great person to be taking advice from. Um, he also writes things like, better than a dog anyhow. And I, I just got a dog about a month ago. And let me tell you, a woman is better than a dog. Okay. I can, I can say that for a fact, a woman is better than a dog. A woman is also not an object, Dar dear Darwin. Um, he did actually end up marrying his first cousin. So he's really not the kind of person you want to take advice from. Um, so that, that's how he fucked up being straight. But how did he fuck up being gay? So Darwin, he goes to uh, the Galapagos and, um, you know, he, he uh, uh, comes up with this theory of evolution. He's basically like the Victorian version of like, on my gap year, I, I went to South America and I just learned so much about, you know, life. Um, Darwin is just the Victorian version of that. Um, and <laughs> he basically came up with this theory where like you have sex to you know, make different versions of yourself to, so they might be better adapted, natural selection. It's all about making babies, right? And in his theory, there's no room for sex, for copulation, that doesn't end up in, um, with, you know, with baby manufacture. There's no like room for that. Um, and I, I do feel very sorry for him that he thought this, you know, because th that would also account for non, non baby making, sex like blowjobs like i i really do think that charles darwin might have thought twice about the theory of evolution if it had prevented him getting blowjobs i mean to be honest i think he wasn't probably getting them anyway considering he could he he thought his wife was an object um but <laughs> anyway so um the the history of kind of um looking into same-sex sexual behavior was not uh really started with someone like darwin it um, it's actually something people have been looking at for a long time, but I thought I would give you this one example of a guy who was actually 
weirdly obsessed with gay penguins. And that was a man called George Murray Levick. Um, he was a Navy man. He was like a scientist -y, surgeon -y type person in the 1910s. And he went on an expedition to Antarctica with Robert Falcon Scott, who you might have heard of, um, big explorer guy. They went to Cape Adair in Antarctica, that's where it is. Um, and he uh, had the task of observing the Adelie penguins who lived there. And he took loads of photos of them. For example, this is a real photo that he took in like 1913 or something of Adelie penguins. And frankly, I'm shocked. I'm shocked that he didn't realize some of these penguins might be gay. Because look at the poise. Look at the grace of these penguins. Like you see that penguin on the left. 100% gay. That that penguin is gay as fuck. <laughs> and he took loads of um, photos, um, and I just want to share them with you because I think they're so funny. Um, and and they really kind of um, show how his Edwardian values were influencing his uh, opinions, his science. Um, you know, so for example, he writes about these two. The hens would keep up this peck pecking hour after hour. I just, okay, you can call it with the misogyny, George, they're, they're just penguins. Um, he writes, for example, with this one, with graceful arching of his neck, they appear to assure her of his readiness to take charge. Because uh, even penguins have gender roles, um, dear darling George. Um, and these photos come from his book that he wrote, Antarctic Penguins. Um, and you can see here these two lovely penguins. They're in love. Their, their heads are even making a little heart. How cute is that? Um, but he, he actually left out all of the gay bits that he observed. I mean, who does he think he is? Hollywood? Um, and because he wrote all about sex, but he, he did notice like the gay sex that was happening. He just didn't put it in the book. Um, so he kept copious notes. We know this because he kept copious notes. For example, here, this is a real page from his notebook um, and he writes kind of everything he sees. So right at the top, you can see something that says like, no more eggs yet in the nest. And then on the third line, you'll see something so depraved happens that he switches to Greek. Yeah, he's like, I can't possibly write this in English. Someone might read it they might read about the gay penguins because here in greek he's writing about these two male penguins having sex um and i i do actually think it's very interesting that he decided to like code his uh notes in greek you know because his logic was basically like the only people who would be able to read it would be educated gentlemen or greek people um <laughs> but he so um I do, I do really think it's interesting that he picked Greek, you know, because it's a, it's a language from a country that is famed for its staunch heterosexuality and, and never ever deviating from that. I hope you enjoy that slide. That is, in fact, my favourite slide. I have put it up about 10 feet wide at the Science Museum. I love that slide because you never see it coming. Yeah, he did, that guy in the middle, but um, you don't. <laughs> Um, anyway, so he um, he actually did end up writing George Murray Lerick about these gay penguins. Um, he wrote this paper, The Sexual Habits of the Adeli Penguin. But you can see at the top he wrote, not for publication. What if the masses got a hold of this information? What chaos would ensue? Um, I just love the idea of like Edwardian men reading the paper being like, oh my goodness. Have you heard about this new gay thing they're talking about? Should we give it a try? It sounds like awful fun. <laughs> no, instead he made a private paper. He only printed about 100 copies. He distrib distributed it um, to natural history museums um, and other scientists, that sort of thing. And at the bottom here, you can see just a little excerpt that I thought I would share with you. And he writes, um, here on one occasion, I saw what I took to be a cock copulating with a hen. When he had finished, however, and got off, um, good observation. The apparent hen turned out to be a cock and the act was again performed with their positions reversed. It is nice to know that penguins aren't precious about who's top, top and bottom. Um, but yeah, he, so he writes this paper and it was buried for ages and then not like not that long ago, surprisingly not that long ago, the Natural History Museum um, uncovered all of this stuff and were like, oh my god, he like actually had all this stuff on gay penguins. Um, he, you know, he writes about how these penguins are like hooligans in this paper. This paper is like very emotive. And that's why I thought it was so interesting because um, he uses kind of very moralistic language, um, which you can't really use for an animal. 
because you know animals don't really have morals and yet he's doing that why because when people tell you that being queer being lgbt is unnatural they don't really mean unnatural they mean immoral that's that's what they're really trying to get at um because if they really were talking about naturalness you know the, here are all the animals that have, not all of them actually, there's about 1500 species that same sex sexual behavior has been observed in. Here are just some of them. Every single animal you can see here has had, um, look, there's so many of them, there's even a second layer. Um, all of these animals have had same sex sexual behavior observed in them. Um, so it's not really about nature, it's about morality. That's what people are talking about. And I, I get that, you know, I came from a religious background. Um, and to those people, I, I do want to ask one question, um, which is, you know, the, how they always say like, oh, a penis was made to fit in a vagina and, and that's how God made you. Why then did God make us where our arms stopped, where our genitals begin? I, I actually think God wants us to masturbate. I, I think that's what he was he, he intended. Like, have you ever wondered why you can't tickle yourself, but you can masturbate? It's because God, God wants you to do it. So when people say like, it's unnatural, you know, and you really want to go down that science route, what you can tell them is actually, the planet is queer by nature. Thank you very much. Incredible, massive round of penguin applause for Florin Schechter. Whoa, again, just like poof, so much in there. We've got a very, very nice, tiny amount of uh, a bit of words, amount of time for questions. Does anyone have a question they want to throw at Florence? Uh, just wave and unmute yourself. Anyone in the gallery? No, uh, nope, haven't missed anyone. Cool, no worries if not, that was so incredible. Give her another round of applause. Yeah, so cool. Okay, we have one very, very, very quick gay penguin challenge for you. As we are the Sex and Nature Salon, we are of course fascinated by the intricacies of penguin love and romance. Um, penguins may live on the most icy and barren areas of the planet, but we know that there is nothing warmer or softer than the penguin heart. But also they're materialistic weirdos who steal other people's rocks and eggs. So penguin love is a very, very baffling game. With that in mind, our next game is Penguin Flirt. Three lucky contestants are going to see if you have what it takes to seduce a penguin and win their heart. You will have one minute to find an object in your home that you think can attract and maybe even retain the affections of a penguin. We are barring the 20 kilograms of bird seed. That's cheating. Nope, sorry. I'm sorry, Rachel. I'm sorry, Ruby. It's too strong. It's already an unfair advantage. <laughs> so uh, we're going to give a couple of contestants 60 seconds to go on the Gay Penguin Romantic Challenge. I need three volunteers. James, cool. You're number one. Uh, who else is game? Ch -ch -ch. Artemy, nice one. That's two. And go on. One third person. Be brave. I'm looking at you, Benedict. Hmm? You game? Yes! Okay, so hold it right there. I'm going to set the timer for 60 seconds. Let's play Penguin Flirt in three, two, one, go. In the meantime, Penguin Rachel and Penguin Ruby, while we have you here, can you tell us, what are you looking for in a penguin partner? Um, where, where are they? Ruby, 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 Ruby. Um, where are those screen? Hey, Ruby. Hey. Um, hey, can you tell us a little bit about what you're looking for in penguin love? Um, so I'm, I'm looking for someone with similar dress sense to me, um, keeping it black and white. Um, I get very upset if it's not like that i don't know how many colors i can see but that's what works best for me it's, it's great to be able to share clothes you know okay cool so monochrome is kind of essential um I'd say. Any, any big nose would that be rainbow outfits that's just a straight up not interesting yep. very confusing even painful to the eye um so that's enough for me 
and just in front yeah. yes and no boxes okay cool um rachel rachel what about you um how would you describe your ideal romantic penguin date oh um probably a bit of a, a bit of a slip and slide if you don't mind my my pun um i'd have to say um we'd start start on the ice and end in the um, water in terms of I don't know. i'm not sure where we do it but it would be from a slip. Yeah, you get you get what I'm saying. I should have stopped. I should have stopped. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, this is the time and the place. <laughs> um, in terms of gifts, are there any firm in the last two seconds? Any firm knows on what would be an immediate like deal breaker? Um, as a gift, possibly a dress. A dress. <laughs> well, wow. strictly strictly suits in in the old. Penguin gay world. So if you're giving me okay. a dress, you're misfired. Okay, well, so very fashion oriented on both counts in terms of the requirements of romantic love. Let's yeah, it's see. almost as if we don't know loads about penguins. <laughs> 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 Let's see if any of our <clears throat> contestants were up to the task. Let's start with, I mean, okay, speaking of impeccable dress sense. Benedict, where are you? Um, unmute yourself and come in. What what did you find that you think could seduce one of our lovely penguins? Right. Well, it, of course, this all this all came upon me rather suddenly. I wasn't expecting it. So I've I've got four things. Am I allowed that? Benedict, you are right. above and beyond. This is this is to compensate for the fact that individually they're all shit. Um, first thing, I have a I have a thermometer to take the temperature of the ice caps so that we can monitor it closely and protect their landscape. Secondly, I've got a copy of Happy Feet so that we can, we can sit and have very pleasant evenings watching together. Thirdly, I have postcards from Penguin so that when we are separated, we can write to each other. And fourthly, it's the wrong species, but I think interspecies mingling is important. I've got a picture of a big cock. So was that like a seduction for a day or an all-rounded proposal? You've managed the temperature. Of it is. I, 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 I just sense that we're going to get on very well and that our first night of wild passion on the ice is going to, is going to unfold into a lifetime together in which we correspond, watch films and take each other's temperatures. Great, so a very gentle intro there from Benedict, really kind of lukewarm and tentative. Cool, strong start. Artemy, what did you find that you think could seduce a penguin and win their heart? So we all know penguins love their rocks. So I've got, not sure how well you can see, shiny math rocks. So they can enjoy the rocks, they can use them to fuel their imagination, to decide on, you know, there's various games you can play using them, both safe for work and not safe for work. Yeah. Again, another... And, and also, if we're doing the, uh, the multiple thing, I've also got a nice cute pillow for leaning up against. So again, multiple options from Artemy. The competition is already very, very strong. Uh, James, you're our final contestant. The romantic Oi. competition is high. What did you find that you hope will seduce one of our wonderful penguins? Well, I've, I've also planned a multi-stage uh, evening of romance. Um, first, I thought we'd start with uh, dinner, the small jar of anchovies. Um, there we go, something time for everyone and then as a token of affection carrying on the uh, theme of present presenting um you know how the penguins as part of their mating rituals present a shiny pebble i have here uh this marble bust of karl marx uh which i think any penguin would be honored uh to plant their cloaca around um then as the evening becomes more sensual i thought what could be more appropriate in antarctica um, uh, a part of the world where uh, sunlight is almost constant for some part of the year, then uh, rubbed down with uh, suntan lotion. Um, and finally, I thought we might retreat to uh, my own private Antarctic island, to which the Google Maps link is in the chat. I will just allow people to follow that. 
when they say that no man is an island, I am the exception to that. Just throwing that out there. Anyone got an advance on a fucking island? No. Right. Well, so I think we can all agree that every participant came into that really gently, just like <laughs> competitive. Really Love isn't a game, Sean. I'm not, I'm not messing around here. I'm in it to win it. I'm here for commitment. Well, not like these other dilettantes. Certainly very thorough from everybody. Um, Ruby and Rachel, I don't know how you're going to choose which of these wonderful contestants um, you would go on a date with or pursue romantically, but I think we're all on tender hooks to hear your thoughts. Penguin, Rachel, who, I mean, who stole your heart? Who won it for you? I mean, to start off, I wish my human dates made this much effort. Like, this in one minute, this has been more effort than I've had on any of the real-life hour-long dates um, I've been on. Um, absolutely incredible. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've got to say for me, I'm going to say, it's got to be the shiny little pebble dice from Artemy, just because genuinely I'm intimidated by both Benedict and James um, and actually in my penguin relationship I'd quite like to be the sort of giver and the kind of like you know the the mask top and like you know that that kind of penguin vibe and I just from the fact that in 60 seconds the pair of did that I just know there is no world in which I would maintain that role for any length of time. Um, so 100% for me, it's got to be Artemy and the little shiny dice and the little pillow, because I just feel like I could I could actually maybe sort of, you know, keep matching that in some way. So for me, it's Artemy and the shiny but dice. Massive round of applause for Artemy. You know, like sometimes it helps to take the indirect approach. Um, well, Artemy, I hope that you're delighted. I'm so excited to see how this unfolds. Penguin Ruby, I mean, the stakes are very high. You've been offered mm. kind of all round packages of someone's, you know, offered you an island. Um, someone's offered, you know, a kind of cultural uh, entry into your world. Uh, who was it for you who really, you know, won romantically? <laughs> Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for the effort that you've put into trying to sleep with us. We really respect it. Um, yeah, we love that here at Penguin headquarters. Um, so obviously, I would uh, I would never step on toes with my best friend's date. So for me, I'm going to say I'm between Benedict and James. Um, and James, I love the sort of long recline you were in throughout the seduction. That That did things for me. Um, but ultimately, I said how important fashion was to me how important matching was. So I think it's going to have to be Benedict. They laid their cards on the table and Benedict, you firmly hit the mark. So congratulations to you. Uh, well, what a wonderful romantic springboard on which to welcome our third amazing speaker for the night. I'm so, so, so excited to have him and you are all going to love him. Um, he is another exciting researcher in the history of sexuality. He's a PhD student in history from Oxford Brookes University. Please give a massive warm penguin welcome to Ross Brooks. Thank you so much, Sean, and, and to everyone involved with this wonderful event. It's um, I've, I've, been so absorbed in it, I actually forgot that I had a job to do. So I'm just going to quickly remind myself. But no, thank you. And, and to Ina as well, um, and to Florence for such wonderful um, uh, historical takes as well. Why are we so obsessed with gay penguins? Well, yes, it definitely has something to do with the fact that there is a broader obsession with, with penguins. And just historically, the most rampant anthropomorphism Yes, we, we, um, you know, she um, highlighted March of the Penguins, an absolute atrocity. Happy feet, Benedict, no, it's wrong. Um, but so when we think about gay penguins, queer penguins, and I agree that those, those words we shouldn't really be using, but when, when there are observations of, of non-heteronormative sexual behaviours um, in penguins and other non-human animal species, yes, it's got zoological interest and we can have some great fun with it as well but it also poses tremendous challenges to the patriarchal and, and queer phobic um, representations of people as well. 
What I wanted to do, actually, I mean, Florence, let's let's pretend we're best friends that we've met and that this that, that we planned this um, because you spoke of um, of Levick, who of course had this, this tremendous personal anxiety um, in the Edwardian period, and he didn't publish his results. Um, they were, were privately circulated, uh, as, as Florence said. So what I want to do here is say what happened next. And to highlight a, a naturalist slightly later period, we're actually talking about the 1920s when he made his observations and he reported them in the, in the 1930s, um, who just had a, a tremendously different way of dealing with the observations of same-sex sexual behavior in the penguins. Now here, I'm gonna try and share my screen if I possibly can. Just bear with me, share. So who I want to talk about is, this, uh, he, this is a pre-David Attenborough period. Um, Thomas Haining Gillespie really was one of the, the great popularizers of, nat of natural history. Um, he was, for example, on the BBC radio programme Children's Hour. He appeared regularly as the zoo man um, to answer children's questions about um, animals. But it is his extraordinary narrative of sex misattribution, um, which appears in um, one of his, his, his numerous popular works, um, A Book of King Penguins, originally published in 1932, um, which I want to look at today. Um, aside from being one of the great popularizers of zoology through the interwar period, um, Gillespie was also a founder of the Royal Zoological Society in Scotland, and the Scottish National Zoological Park, which is now Edinburgh Zoo, opened um, 1913, if I remember correctly. Gillespie's observations of king penguins um, were largely based on birds which arrived at the zoological park um, in Edinburgh in 1914, so you know, soon after the zoo opened. The first to arrive, um, the five of them, they were initially named Andrew, Bertha, Caroline, Dora and Eric. Um, king penguins show very little um, physical sex dimorphism. Um, and these names were um, allocated on assumptions about their courting behavior, about which Gillespie regaled at length in a chapter titled Personal and Domestic Relations. His account of the king penguins' love affairs and their matrimonial arrangements and disasters is utterly unique for the period. Um, the narrative of diverse pairings and mistaken sex identifications made all the queerer by Gillespie's palpable relish in telling the story. Um, I've put an, a, a, an example here. This is how he opens his chapter. Um, I shall have, I fear, to make some regrettable disclosures and some damaging admissions. Um, and he related these over some 30 pages in, in very um, infantilized rhetoric. Um, essentially, this book's aimed for older children and, and young adults. Of course, his error was to assume that care, devotion and nurturing behavior exhibited by a bird meant that it was female and that aggression ac and active courting behavior indicated a male. Following an episode where Andrew, having mated with Caroline, began to show affection for Bertha, Gillespie wrote, the behavior of the birds during this interesting period seemed to bear out the conviction I had formed regarding the sex of the three. Caroline's care and devotion to the egg um, were just uh, what one ought to expect from a right-minded mother penguin, while the frivolous, heartless and careless conduct of Andrew seemed so essentially masculine. Well, Gillespie's stereotyped gender assumptions um, projected onto his avian charges suffuse his narrative, but his purposeful storytelling works to reveal his error and establish an entirely different matrix of gender relations between the penguins. In practice, his presentation of male domesticity and female promiscuity and homosexual pairing was no less stereotyped than his earlier constructions. But by portraying himself as a duped, shocked and humiliated victim of what comes across as little more than a joke of nature, he worked hard to distance himself from any culpability as he narrates the varied sexual relations of the birds. Eventually, Gillespie arrives at the, what he calls the climax of the drama, when in 1920, the ever-changing sexual relationships between the birds and the production of an egg by Andrew necessitated some swift name changes and no small amount of rhetorical flourish by Gillespie. 
So here I put um, just another example. <laughs> it's just, just delightful um, intellectual gymnastics. Andrew, I decided then to call him in future Anne, was and is a female. Caroline was just as certainly male. Alas, for the picture I have tried to draw of motherly love and wifely duty and feminine excellence. How devastating is truth. These virtues I had imagined lie shattered and their fragments convict me of a grave slander against the whole masculine world. Caroline it is, I must now in future call um, him Charles, who stands for the highest ideal of paternal devotion and domestic duty and self-sacrificing labour. Anne is revealed as unstable and undomestic, fickle, flirtatious and feminine. So, so different from Le Levick, a completely different response. Well, Bertha was renamed Bertrand, uh, Dora remained Dora, um, but Eric was renamed Erica. Amid all the melodrama, however, Gillespie did make the pertinent zoological point for the first time published, albeit still slanted by gender bias, which despite its embellishment had never previously been made in a published work. Summarizing the lessons that he had learned about the courtship patterns of king penguins, he wrote, Having married her man, so to speak, the female penguin is quite ready once she has him safely saddled with the care of her family to have an affair with another male. If any unattached are available, the male seems willing to reciprocate the feelings of any female who chooses him. In default of better, a male will play at courtship with a male or a female with a female. Yes, in, in default of better, I mean, that's, that's somewhat begrudging, but um, still the first time we get an observation in, in published um, of, of same-sex sexual behaviour in penguins. Well, his rhetorical choices undoubtedly helped to soften the impact of narrating animal behaviours which did not conform to prevailing gender norms in British society. Still, he clearly also considered the story to be humorous and related the penguins, what he called triangular and contentious love affairs in a dramatic manner for the sheer entertainment of it. Gillespie himself suggests that his motives were mixed, stating that I have given the details of these personal and matrimonial arrangements at some length, not only because they seem to me to be as amusing as they are interesting, but also because I wish to show the grounds for the conclusions to which one has been led. Well, certainly nobody seems to have complained. Um, the, the book, um, A Book of King Penguins, was well received with re reviewers echoing um, Gillespie's famed exclamation at the penguins varied courtship habits and his infantilized rhetoric. Um, for example, a reviewer for The Scotsman on the 10th of October 1932 remarked that readers will find amusement in the chapters which tell of the mother who was after all really a father and the father who proved ultimately to be the lady. As the author confesses, there is no accounting for king penguins. Well, beyond such popular rhetorical posturing, however, the broad arena of animal behaviour studies was changing rapidly through the interwar era. Already by the time Gillespie was writing, a diverse array of academic um, um, animal psychologists, behavioralists and naturalists were striving to find new ways of accounting for animal, including human, sexual courtship and reproductive behaviours in all their complexity. Although, in practice, their endeavours were rarely far removed from the hegemonic gender and sexual cultural norms and the eugenic fantasies of the interwar era. Um, this, this is a great source, this book, for, for teachers and students, anyone with an interest in, in, in um, how peoples of the past have responded to um, um, unfamiliar um, and generally reviled sexual behaviours. Um, this, this is tremendous. Um, I, you'll see that these, these great pictures, there's lots of pictures, none of them, um, agendered actually, he, he kind of lays off. So we actually have some images here of queer penguins in the 1920s in action. Thank you very much indeed. Amazing, massive round of penguin applause for Ross Brooks. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I feel like I've already, I've ingested so many more images of penguins boning in the last 19 <laughs> than I have over the course of 30 years. That was incredible. Again, just so much like fascinating stuff. Um, we have a couple of minutes for questions before we get to the very, very, very end of the show. Um, does anyone have a question for Russ? Uh, just wave your hand and unmute yourself if you'd like to come in. Just have a look across the screen. Was that a wave? Don't be shy. Da, 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 da. 
Malcolm's scratching his head. That's not a question. <laughs> That's just a, how do I get this itch away from my skull? Okay, well, that was so awesome. Thank you, Ross. Another massive Thank round you. of applause. Incredible speakers. Well, everyone, I think that we may in the room have the answer to why are we obsessed with gay penguins? Because if you weren't already, Penguin Ruby and Penguin Rachel over the course of this show, I feel have done a job of answering that question for us. Um, we're super excited to have them here as our final act in and of themselves of the night. I mean, you, you've already been like outstanding. It's so amazing to have you here. Um, everyone, are you ready to welcome our gay penguin guests in our rousing finale? Awesome. Listen, start the virtual penguin applause, build it up, make it wild, make it massive, and please welcome Rachel and Ruby. Hey. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we're just going to do a sort of little final song for you guys. Um, normally, Ruby and I would be together um but unfortunately because of coronavirus we can't be um just makes this a little tricky um so it's going to be a song unfortunately like the titular character of happy feet i have absolutely no musical talent um usually i sort of dance whimsically next to ruby um but instead i'm just going to sort of dance in the background um and we're going to do a little song we did some research on gay penguins um, and we saw today the little news story and a lot of news stories about uh, gay penguins stealing eggs. Um, and so we've done a little a little song um, about that, um, which Ruby's going to perform for you guys now. Yeah, uh, just, you know, the lengths that our community has to go to when we're not afforded proper adoption rights. Um, so we're going to perform. We have sort of borrowed the tune, but we kept it in the bird family. Uh, we borrowed it from a robin. So you might have heard this before. Here we go. Somebody said you got a new egg. Do you love it better than we can? I don't want a chick that's too far grown. That egg's gonna be Yeah, I know it's stupid But we can't reproduce ourselves I'm in the corner Watching your egg now Whoa I'm right over here Honestly, when will penguins ever come this genetic defect? <laughs> in the corner Why can't you see me Stealing your egg I'm stealing your egg now And it's the egg we're taking home Whoa -ho -ho -ho. We'll steal straight eggs for our own We'll steal straight eggs for our own We're just gonna steal eggs all night we're so messed up, we're so out of line Flippers on broken eggshells If we could, we'd make one ourselves I'm in the corner, watching your egg now Whoa I'm right over here, why can't you see me? Whoa I'm stealing your egg now, and it's the egg we're taking home. Whoa, ho, ho. we'll steal straight eggs for our own. So far away, but still so near. I've got your eggs in my sights. You can't see me standing here, waiting for adoptive rights i'm in the corner watching your egg now whoa i'm stealing your egg now and it's the egg we're taking home whoa ho, ho. we'll steal straight eggs for our own we'll steal straight eggs for our own foxy world thank you 
Oh my gosh. <laughs> Incredible. Thank you so much, Penguin Rachel and Penguin Ruby. Um, this brings us to the end of the Sex and Nature Salon. You have been such a fantastic audience. I hope you all had a wonderful time and you now have all the gay penguin knowledge you could foreseeably use in your everyday lives. Um, and what an amazing lineup. Please give another massive round of virtual applause for our amazing speakers and acts. We had Dr. Ina Linga, Florence Schechter, Ross Brooks, and to our gay penguin star guests, Penguin Ruby and Penguin Rachel, AKA Shelf. Thank you also to our technical host for the night, um, Andrew White. He's been just like geniusly busying away in the corner, making it all run super smoothly. Um, and also thank you so much to the um, Exeter Uni Arts and Culture team, Anna Bunt, Dr. Stephen Hodge, Dr. Sarah Campbell. If you wanna find out more about the events that Arts and Culture Exeter are running, you can find them on the website or on the social media handles, which will come up in the chat of oh, Exeter Uni. Nice. <laughs> Thanks, Kat. Um, yeah, also in the details, details that also in the chat are the details of where you can find all the amazing people who you saw today online. Um, yeah, but please follow Arts and Culture Exeter for the details of our next show. It has been so wonderful to have you all as such a like, I'm blown away, like so creative. Uh, yeah, a massively creative group at our first event. Um, we would love you to share any comments or thoughts or feedback on the mural or keep an eye on your emails because we love feedback. We just love the feedback. Please tell us how we can make the next event even bigger and better. Um, oh, and most importantly, I can now finally announce the winner of the Best Dressed Penguin of the Night competition, a very elite uh, fashion <laughs> judging panel have agreed that it was difficult, but it definitely has to be Benedict Morrison who stole it this evening. So well done, Benedict. You will be receiving some Arts and Culture Exeter tote bags. Hooray, which go perfectly with your amazing tuxedo. So well done, everyone. Um, that's it from us. I've been Shandoxy. Please follow everyone you saw this evening on social media. You have all been wonderful. A massive round of applause for everyone you saw again this evening. And thank you very much and good night.